talk a little bit about cupping coffee because anytime anytime we're working with producers we need to have a way to give um, to evaluate what we're doing so if we're implementing any kind of strategy on the farm or strategy and processing there needs to be a way that we can evaluate that and use the evaluation to basically say, was what we tried to achieve accomplished? Are we being effective or are we not being effective? Otherwise, if we're not evaluating every little thing that we're doing, then we're just trying different stuff and feeling our way through feeling, well, I felt like this was good, but maybe we should try something different, or I felt like this was bad. Um, but if we can actually have hard data that can give us um, the data we need to make wise decisions on our farm, and, and, these dis and, and this data actually can help people all the way through the supply chain make decisions. It can help people know whether to buy or not buy a coffee. It can help people to know um, whether it would mix well with another coffee, what kind of roast profile to use on it. Um, there's all sorts of ways that this data can be used to help us develop coffee. But it will be impossible to develop coffee without a proper way of evaluating it. And with coffee, the main way to do that is called cupping. Um, so why do people cup? <clears throat> oh, j just a side note as well. This slide is also borrowed from the Specialty Coffee Association of America, um, with permission. So, so we use it for purchasing to know what to purchase, not just whether or not something is good or bad, but also um, different markets like different characteristics about their coffee. Um, the Koreans like a different type of coffee than the Americans like. Um, and understanding this and using cupping to evaluate that can help us make better decisions when we're purchasing coffee. Or when we're, if we're a producer, when we're producing coffee for a specific market. Quality and price discovery. When we cut, we can have a better understanding of what the quality is. Is there defects present? Is there not? Um, what is the value of this coffee? Um, cupping, cupping does can kind of set the the difference between whether it has defects or doesn't have defects, and then whether or not it may be clean and not have defects, but whether or not the flavors are unique and complex. <clears throat> Cupping allows us to actually uh, document this in hard data. Cupping also gives us a way to verify that the coffee that we purchased um, is the same coffee that was delivered to us if we're purchasing coffee internationally or if we're selling the coffee internationally and we send a sample to a buyer, he's going to use the cupping protocols um, to verify that it's the same coffee that he tasted before shipment is the same coffee that actually arrived, arrived at his warehouse in the United States or Europe or Indonesia or wherever. So quality assurance, sorry. Um, making sure that the, the things that we're putting in place on our farm or in our processing centers is actually being effective. So we make decisions to improve quality 
uh, to improve uh, sustainability with how much we're spending at different parts of the farming practices or parts of the processing and we need to be able to test those and say okay are we are we actually getting our money's worth um, if we implement a type of um, a type of sorting machine we need to be able to test it and see that it's actually effective and worth the money we're spending on sorting the coffee I think this was the first blending was also with the first cupping um, gives us the ability to to know what the different attributes are and and make wiser decisions when we blend coffees palate enrichment people cup to develop their palate to develop their understanding so I I don't always have the opportunity within my work to cup coffee every week. But I'm trying to make sure that I'm doing it every week so that my palate is stays developed and it's like a muscle. It's like you have to work out in the gym to build the muscles in your arms. It's the same with cupping. You have to build the muscles, um, your sensory muscles and being able to um, evaluate and understand coffee. And we use it for education or training. Cupping is, an, is a very, very powerful tool to, um, to educate or to train farmers, um, to educate customers. I mean, if you're working on the um, on the retail side of coffee and you're wanting to provide your customers with a better quality coffee but it costs more you need to educate your customers on why they should pay more for your coffee um, um, if you're if you're doing a single origin and you're helping a project with certain communities um, in you know in rural parts of Southeast Asia and you want to mark up that price for that coffee, you want to sell it at a premium, you need to, you need to educate people, you need to um, help them understand what they're actually buying, why they're paying more, and cupping is a very powerful tool. Um, there's a practice within cupping, um, it's used as testing if you're, if you're becoming a professional cupper called triangulation. I think triangulation, for me, when I was just getting into to cupping, triangulation was one of the more powerful things I did because you have three cups and two cups will be the same coffee and the third cup will be a different coffee and then you kind of mix them around. You don't know which cup is which cup. You turn off the lights, you can't see the color difference and if you can, if you can taste those three cups and pick which cup is different, for, for me, that really helped me start to see the differences between one coffee and another. In normal cupping, you just have like, you know, your, your five cups on the table and they all have the same coffee and you taste each one. Um, and it's great. And then you move on to the next one. But for me, the triangulation with the three cups really specifically helped me dis distinctly say, wow, these coffees are very similar, but this coffee has much better body than this coffee or this coffee has much better acidity or whatever it's a very powerful tool so this is the new york sea coffee market um, sometimes coffee is even traded Specialty coffee is traded um, based on the New York... Commodity coffee is traded on the New York Sea. And sp then you have specialty coffee, which a lot of times is traded at a premium based on the New York Sea. So it'll be the New York Sea plus a certain amount for, for a specialty price. So let's say you have like an... Uh, uh, 
especially, we'll talk about this more, but especially coffee is something that scored at an 80. And let's say in the contract you say that if it scores an 85, then I'm going to get the New York C plus $2 or plus, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then you have, um, once, once a coffee estate has been able to produce consistently over several years, especially quality coffee, then it can stop trading according to the New York Sea and they can set their own estate prices. And a lot of these, a lot of these estates in South America that are winning the big international awards, they don't, they have, they just add, they say, this is the price I want. They have what we call an estate price and they just set the price and it has nothing to do with the market at all. There's a guy, Rian and I were talking about, I think you know him, uh, Dang. Mm. Uh, he, he's basically set his own this year, his own estate price yeah. in Thailand. And it's, it's raising a lot of eyebrows because it's, it's really expensive, but he pre-sold it before the har He pre-sold all of his coffee before the harvest season at a, at the most expensive price that any Thai person has ever paid for coffee. So at 600 baht a kg for green coffee. Um, so it's, I mean, you, I don't think I would want to buy the coffee, but you can't blame the guy if people are willing to pay it. And that's essentially what he's doing. And he's able to do this because he's selling to a market in Thailand that is cupping their coffee. They're evaluating it. They're realizing that his coffee is high quality and unique. So, there's some rules when cupping coffee. When you cup coffee, it needs to be quiet. There needs to be no interruptions. Sorry, what? Huh? Um, it, it is a... When you're evaluating coffee, it is a very intense, thoughtful process. You want to think through it. You want to, you want to fully engage it. If there's interruptions happening or a lot of chaos happening, you want the same kind of environment that you would study. Maybe you're studying for uh, a, a test or you're studying for a presentation that you have to give. You want the same kind of environment. You also want there to be no talking. If I'm evaluating a coffee, I don't want the person across the table from me talking about the coffee. That would bring bias. So if, if Skylar's over there talking about the coffee saying, wow, this is so sweet. When I get around there and I taste that coffee, I'm just going to be thinking about what he said. But you don't, you don't want other people. It's very important that you remain quiet and that when you evaluate the coffee, you're not thinking about what somebody else said. No perfume, cologne, or aftershave. Also, you need to shower because the, the opposite of that is bad body odor. You don't, you don't want to give a coffee a bad score because the guy next to you didn't shower. Um, you, your senses need to be at, the, at their peak. That is, tech, that is roughly two to three hours after you wake up in the morning. So if you're scheduling a cupping in your workplace or at your office, a good time to do it would be mid-morning. You're still fresh. You're not tired. Um, you don't want to do it immediately after eating. So like right after lunch is not a good time. Because what you ate could have an impact on your ability to taste as well. Not immediately after brushing your teeth or gargling. No breath mints, chewing gum. 
This is what I was talking about earlier, no talking during evaluations. Actively focus on your senses. Be consistent from one cupping to the next. Move around the table clockwise. This is different from place to place. Some people move counterclockwise. Some people move clockwise. The, the main key here is that the cupping table is not like a, a jar full of candy with a bunch of children reaching in to get the candy. The cupping table should be orderly and people should go from one, shifting from one to one to one. And if it's not space for them, they step back and wait. Okay, in order to cut properly, you're going to need a sample roaster. Um, a sample roaster or a very small, like what we call a lab roaster. A lab roaster is um, like 2 kgs or less. Something that you can do small, like really tiny batches in as well. When you cup coffee, you don't want to have to you don't want to have to roast a big batch of coffee just for your cupping. An Agtron or another color reading device, these are really expensive. The Agtron meter is super expensive. The the tiles that you buy are also expensive. I it's really not accurate, but I just usually Google uh, Google images the Agtron numbers that I'm looking for. And although my screen may not be 100% accurate, it gets me close. Agtron is a, is a color system for measuring the, the, dark, the, the profile of a roast. So basically, actually we're on the next slide now. It's talking about the roast. Basically... We're all human, right? So, when we taste coffee and when we scorch coffee, there's gonna be room for error. We're not a machine. Um, we're all gonna do it slightly differently. We may give slightly different scores. Um, we, you can't, you can't get away from that, a hundred percent. But if you can control all the different variables about your cupping, um, if you can control all the protocols, if we can control the roast profile, and every time we cup coffee, we have the exact same roast profile. If we can control the water, the temperature of the water, if we can control the water to coffee ratio, all of these things, if we can control them, then when we taste the coffee and we taste differences in coffee, we're tasting the actual difference of the green coffee. We're not tasting the difference of the roast profile or the temperature. Because all of these things affect the flavor, right? The roast profile affects the flavor. The water temperature affects the flavor. The extraction rate. Water temperature affects the extraction rate, which affects the, the, the flavor. Um, water to coffee ratio affects extraction, which affects the flavor. So if we want to start evaluating a green bean, all right, a green coffee bean, we want to evaluate it, we want to give it a score, and we want to say this, this coffee bean is specialty or not specialty then we have to do it in a way where we control all the different things that they they, they could change the outcomes and every time we do a different green coffee we have the same set protocol that we use across the board does that make sense the right TDS is important um, the grind size so the grinder and the actual grind size is very important, that what you're grinding your coffee. So we'll go through each one of these things. The SCAA has set a standardized protocol saying when you cup coffee, you need to do it this way. 
We don't just grab the dark roasted coffee off the shelf at the grocery store and go cup it. In fact, dark roasted coffee would be next to impossible to actually evaluate the green bean because um, when you dark roast coffee, you've destroyed most of the organic material and the volatile compounds have dissipated and are no longer there. So the cupping protocol, according to the SCAA, is that you need to cup coffee within eight to 24 hours after roasting the coffee. The roast should be light to light medium. The Agtron color meter, like I said, there's a machine you can use that you kind of zap, you, you use the machine, um, put it over the beans, it reads the color, it will give you an Agtron number, or you can have these tiles that you can buy, they're like little cards with different shades of brown, or you can do like me and just Google it. But the roast, the Agtron beans on the outside should be a 58, so they have an actual card that says 58 and it's a specific color of brown. The inside should be a 63. The roast should be completed in 8 to 12 minutes. And it doesn't say it here, but it should go for 2 to 3 minutes after first crack. Oh, wow. Well, these are in the independent banks. More than $100 for it. Oh, yeah. So these are not something we're going to play with. I'll, I'll let you look at them in class, but as soon as we're done with them, we'll give them back because <laughs> they're very expensive. This 58 and 63. So this is a 55. This is close. The outside of the bean, when it's whole, not grounded, should be very similar to this color here. And... This is the color it should be when it's ground. Where did I just put that one? Hold on. Do you guys see a color difference? I'll pass them around. So when you roast coffee, the coffee bean is going through intense chemical changes. And when you finish roasting, over the course of the next couple of weeks, it continues to change and shift. The molecules shift, and the flavor can actually change for up to two weeks. You can taste it right after it's been roasted, and then taste it again in two weeks, and it can have different flavors. So they do this to set a standard, they don't, when we cup different, like let's say we're cupping five different cup types of coffees. We don't want to taste the differences on how long we waited after the roast. We create a strict protocol of how long we roast, what profile we, what color we roast to, how long after we roast we cup. All of these protocols create a, a framework that enables us to, when we taste the coffee, we're, we're tasting the actual difference of the green beans and not the difference of a roast profile or how long we waited. So the coffee changes drastically from the time, from it's one day old to it's two weeks old, it can taste very, very differently. So some coffee is actually, a sign of a good coffee is it actually gets better over time. Well, according to cupping, the SCAA is stating between 8 to 24 hours is the, but it's still not fully degassed. So when we sell at retail, they suggest waiting a week to two weeks before using it within your coffee shop. So the environment, well lit, clean, cupping tables, quiet. 
comfortable temperature, limited distractions. Like a testing room. Preparation, we need a scale because we want to weigh exactly how much coffee we put in each cup. We want the ratio to be perfect. Cupping glasses, spoons, hot water, cupping forms, pencils and clipboards. So the optimum ratio is 8.25 grams to 150 milliliters of water. Do not use distilled water. Distilled water has a TDS of nothing, of zero. It has no solids in it whatsoever and coffee needs the solids in order to get a proper extraction. You weigh the coffee beans into individual cups You need to grind no more than 15 minutes before pouring the water. Or another way to say it is, if you're going to pour the water, you need to have ground that coffee within the last 15 minutes. If you go longer than 15 minutes, your coffee's already stale. They say if you put lids over top of it, you can wait 30. That coffee needs to be not, or that water that you're pouring over it needs to be 93.3 degrees. Also, I'll note to weigh coffee into individual cups. Does anybody know why we do this? When we cup, we have five different cups. And when we're looking for a defect, if we have a defect in one cup, then it gets minus two points. If we have it in two cups, then it's minus four points. So if there's a defect in every cup, then it's getting um, a minus a lot of points. It's getting penalized really badly. So if you have a defect and you grind it first and then put it out in the cups, you can taste that defect in every cup. But you don't wanna do that. We want the beans we want the defects to only go into the cups where that bean is. So if we weigh out the beans first and one cup has a defect, the other cups won't have a defect. And then when we penalize it for that defect, we don't over penalize it because it's in too many cups. So when we grind, we're going to go through and we're going to smell the coffee in its dry fragrance. Then we're going to pour the water. We're going to fill the water up to the rim. And then we have three minutes to go around and smell the aroma. No. We also need to flush the grinders when we grind. That means if, if I'm grinding a certain coffee from Guatemala and I'm putting it into these five cups, before I grind those beans, I actually take some extra Guatemala beans, I put it in the grinder, grind it through, and then throw it away. That the grinder now has been cleaned out with Guatemala beans. Now when I grind this, no other bean is getting mixed in together with that Guatemala beans. And then when I finish the Guatemala, maybe I'm moving on to an Ethiopian, then I take a little Ethiopian, put it in there, flush it, throw it away. In the SCAA and when you do the Q grader, you always cup four different types of coffees. The first three are based on regions. You always cup Asian coffees, African coffees, and washed coffees from South America, which are called milds. And then the fourth type of coffee is not a region coffee. It's a process you always cup naturals. We're gonna weigh the coffee, we're gonna grind it, we're gonna pour it. Then we're gonna steep it for three to five minutes. While it's steeping, we can smell the aroma. And then we're gonna break it. I'll show you guys what this means when we do it. But the crust, the coffee grounds will have, um, 
will have floated to the top and created a crust across the top. And we're gonna take a spoon and without mixing it all together, we're just gonna break open the crust and smell it. And it gives us a good smell of the aromas. Um, then we're gonna clean the tops. We're gonna skim the tops and take the crust off because when we're cupping the coffee, we don't want all those grounds getting in our mouth. I'll show you guys all of this when we go down there. Um, and then we need to wait till it's about 71 degrees or about eight to 10 minutes. It's actually cool, so it might take less time here um, until we can start tasting the coffee. Aspirate, that means slurp. You don't have to but don't make fun of us that do. Feel free to spit it out or get a spitting cup. I'm gonna go through this. You should have one of these in your packet. I'm just gonna briefly, I'm not gonna ask you guys to use this today, but I want you to have an understanding. Um, if you decide in the future to to do any kind of certification or qualification with coffee tasting, evaluating, or if you're talking with people within the coffee industry, you need to have an understanding of this sheet um, so that you know what they're talking about. <clears throat> so this, this has three blocks on it, right? And it says sample number, sample number, sample number. You can put your own codes in here if you're sampling your own coffee. One, two, three. But each one of these is for a sample of coffee. That sample of coffee is gonna be five cups. So we're gonna have a flight, what we call a flight of cup. We'll see them downstairs. It'll have one, two, three, four, five. And that is one sample. So when you fill this out, you're filling it out for those five, that flight of cups or that sample. It's not really getting graded, but we're just checking what is the roast color. We're just making sure if the roast color is somehow way too dark, then you know that the results you're going to get here might not be 100% accurate because it wasn't roasted to the correct roast profile. Then this first box here is both fragrance and aroma, okay? Dry and wet. Fragrance is the smell of it, the grounds when they're dry. Aroma is when they're wet. Um, it'll be impossible if you've never done this before. It would be impossible to know what number to put there. This only happens through cupping with other people who have already um, already learned how to do it. Because they give you numbers 6 to 10, but you don't, know, you don't know where to put the number. Like if you're tasting a coffee, you don't know where. You, you learn this from others who have already been calibrated and certified. Um, there is a diagram that says, I don't know if it's in this poor, I don't think it's in this PowerPoint, but it says six is good, seven is very good, eight is exceptional. Is that, oh, it's at the top of the page. Oh yeah, here it is. But I will tell you, here it says six is good. But if you gave each one of these things a six, it would be less than 80 points and less than 80 points is not specialty. So, so this being six good is really not that accurate, to be honest with you. It needs to be closer to a seven to be specialty. I think a 7.25 actually to be specialty. dry and wet or does it say break or break, break. that means when you break it 
So you smell it dry before you add water, and then at the break, you smell it again. Um, then you give it a score for flavor. This score, the most important thing about this is not whether or not you like the flavor or not, but is there flavor present? How intense is it? Do you taste anything? If you taste something that's not pleasant, it's most likely a defect or a fault of some kind. But if it's a flavor that's actually not bad, but you just don't like it, you can't you can't take off points for that. You you have to still give it a good you have to score it whether you like it or not. You have to score it well if it has good flavor. Yeah. Like descriptor notes like like on the flavor wheel, the presence of one of these. This is the new flavor wheel. The old flavor wheel I actually like much better because it, off to the side, it gives the different taints, the, the things that would be considered negative. But the things that are considered, actually I think these have them all mixed in together. Um, but, but for the most part, any of your um, pretty much on this one, any of these flavors are good. And if they're present, you need to give it a good score. But these flavors, if they're present, you need to give it a bad score. But most likely, some of these flavors, like rubber, would will never be present if it's roasted correctly for cupping. How do we judge flavor? Because it's so, it, it depends from every person what they think is good flavor and what they think is bad flavor. Yeah, that is too individual, you know? But you have to, if you're a professional cupper, you have to go beyond the thing of, I like something or I dislike it. You can't think that way. That's how children think when you tell them what you're cooking them for dinner. Oh, I like that. I don't like that. No, don't cook that, Daddy. I don't like that. That, that is a, a typical way that a lot of us evaluate food or other things that we partake of in our lives. We like it or we dislike it. People, I like that person or I dislike that person. But when it comes to people... Maybe there's somebody that we dislike, but honestly, maybe there's some really good things about that person if we sit and think about it. And it's the same with coffee. We can not like something, but if we think about it, we can say, you know, actually the flavor was quite sweet. It's not, it tastes like jackfruit, and I don't like jackfruit, but it tastes like jackfruit, and some people like that, and so it has good flavor. But it takes a lot of discipline and a lot of practice. So more what we're saying is, is there pr flavor present? Not do we like it or not? And there are a few flavors that if they're present, they're bad. Like chemical and defect and things like that. But for the most part, all flavor is good, whether you like it or not. Yes, Karis. Yeah, um, when you swallow, you the, the, the act of forcing the liquid down your esophagus forces air back up through your nasal pass, passageway and creates, uh, creates an opportunity to, to taste it in a different way. So... So, so taste um, or, or flavor is actually the combination of taste and smell. The definition of flavor is the combination of taste and smell. So when you swallow, you're, you're taking air up a different, like from the back passageway, and you're maybe getting a better opportunity to taste it that way. I prefer, I, some people that are doing it like a lot of coffee in one day will spit it out. 
Um, and that makes a lot of sense to me, but I prefer to swallow it. So, Flavor, aftertaste, after you swallow it, is there an aftertaste? Is there not an aftertaste? If so, is it pleasant? Um, there can be bad aftertaste, like a super bitter, like charcoaly aftertaste that's not nice. Um, then the next one you get is acidity. There's all different types of acidity. We're not going to get into it. Um, there's bad acidity, like phenolic, but for the most part, like malic or um, citric acidities are really nice. The next is body. Body is probably one of the easiest, most straightforward things. Low body would be like if it felt like water in your mouth. If it felt like normal milk that you bought from 7-Eleven in your mouth, it would probably be kind of average. If it felt like cream, like whipping cream, if you were to just drink the whipping cream and it sits heavy in your mouth, that's high body, that's good body. And then the next one is uniformity um, and clean cup. These, these have five little boxes. Each box is represents a cup. So uniformity could mean, do all five cups taste the same? If one cup tastes differently for some reason, you're going to put an X, and this is only going to be worth, each one of the cups that doesn't have an X is two points. So if you put an X here, then you have four cups that are all the same. Four times two is eight, it'll get eight points. You don't need to know that, we're not going to do that today. I just want you guys to understand how this works. It's the same for clean cup, but uniformity is just whether or not it tastes differently than the other cups. Clean cup is whether or not you taste a defect. Do you taste something in that cup of coffee that doesn't belong in coffee? Do any of you guys have good examples of something you've tasted in your coffee that did not belong in coffee? Plastic. You've tasted plastic in coffee. Tea? Oh, cheese. <laughs> yeah, that's bored. Yes, so like mold. If you were to take cheese to the extreme, it's mold, right? And mold doesn't belong in coffee. So, so yes, that would be like a defect. Clean cup means does it have something present in there that's not coffee? So. Is there a substance that's present inside that cup that is not coffee? And mold would be one of those things, which could lead to like a cheese type flavor. Um, plastic could be one of those things. Diesel, I've tasted diesel in coffee before. Um, something that does not belong. Corn, if you drink Vietnamese coffee, you might get some corn mixed in. <laughs> So, um, and then balance here is just a score on how you think all of these go together. Do they balance each other out? Is it smooth? Is it, you know, does it all fit together nicely? It's a bit subjective, a little bit, but for the most part, it should be fairly clear, like, whether or not as you drink it, it all balances out or not, or if there's just like one aspect of it that's like off the chart, it makes, basically you can look at the scores and if they're all scoring a very similar score, you can say it's balanced. If they're not scoring similar, like if it's got really weak fragrance and really weak flavor, but strong aftertaste and strong acidity, then it's an unbalanced cup of coffee. And overall, is at the very end, that's the only place where you really can, as the cupper, give your personal opinion of the coffee. Oh, so the balance combinations of smell, aroma, yeah. color. Yeah. If they're all kind of of similar intensity, then that would, would be called a well-balanced coffee.
So I want us to go down and I want us to put together the cupping together. Um, I want us all to jump in and kind of set up this cupping, weigh out this stuff. We only have one scale so we can take turns weighing it out. And I want us to kind of go through this together and set it up together and then we'll cup these coffees. Did you find that helpful? If you did, consider giving it a like or subscribing to our channel. While you're at it, why not check out our other videos or join our network at echocommunity.org for more interesting and sustainable agriculture solutions. Network members can receive up to 10 free seed packets.